Well, good morning, church. My name is Pastor Mark. For those of you who don't know me, just want to welcome you. We've been welcoming all morning, but uh, if this is your first time, we just to let, let you know that we love having you with us. We right now as a church are going through a series called Explore God, and we're joining with over 150 other churches in the whole Bay Area doing all of the same messages, talking about all the same topics, because we think it's so important for our local region to explore God, have big theological questions. And some of these questions that we have been asking is, does life have a purpose? Is there a God? Why does God allow pain and suffering, and is Christianity too narrow? If if you missed any of those and you want to go and watch them, you can check out our YouTube channel and see all of the sermons from the past four weeks. Today, our topic, the question we're tackling, is Jesus really God? And as we've said with the previous questions... I'm not going to give something to you that is 100% proof that you can take home with you and say, this 100% proves the question that we talked about today. But we're going to look at a lot of evidence that, at least for me, I come away saying that's practically proof right there. So I'm glad that you're joining us this morning, and I want to give us all a warning to buckle your seatbelts, because we got a lot of stuff to go through, and we are going to go through as much as we can, because we could honestly take weeks of Sunday morning sermons to tackle this question. Is Jesus really God? Jesus in the Bible asked people, he asked his disciples, who do people say I am? And they gave so many answers. And I would argue that that question still remains. Who do people say Jesus is? As a child, I was raised in a Christian home. So people told me Jesus is God. From the very beginning, I was told this is who Jesus is. There's no if, ands, or buts. Jesus, God, put them together. But as I've talked about in the last few weeks... It's not enough just for us to hear someone else tell us something, like I'm doing right now. We actually have to do something with that information. We need to make the decision for ourselves of, okay, people say that, but what do I think? And so as I started to get older, okay, Jesus is God, but how can I really know that? What what about Jesus says that he is God? What's the evidence? What are the things that people point to to say that there is something special about Jesus? Because when I look in the Bible and I hear these stories of other people, well, Moses was a guy who split a sea open. Well, he can do miracles and Jesus can do miracles. Is, Is Jesus just like Moses, just a normal guy? What about all the prophets that God sent? Elijah and Elisha, they too did miracles. They too spoke on behalf of God. Is Jesus just a prophet? Just someone that God sent to communicate to his people? Now, I want to establish for us that that Jesus existing on the earth, the majority of scholars all say is a fact, It'll be hard-pressed for you to find people that look at uh, the ancient era and say Jesus did not exist. Amongst scholars, people say Jesus of Nazareth existed. And beyond the Bible, there are two sources that people point to for this understanding. One of them is Josephus, a Jewish scholar who was writing after the days of Jesus, and he was talking about this time period, and there's two references to what we might say are Jesus. The first one I'm not going to share because some people think that it was tampered with, that some Christians got in there and were like, we need to make Josephus say that Jesus existed, so we're going to change that. But the second one, most scholars say, no, that looks legitimate. And this reference, Josephus is referring to a guy named James. And he references this James as as he appears before a a court, a trial, and he's referenced as James, the brother of Jesus, known as the Christ. So here's one outside of the Bible mention of Jesus by this guy named Josephus. And then a Roman historian by the name of Tacitus, he wrote 
about during the days of Emperor Nero. There was a persecution, a fire broke out over all of, over all of Rome, or a one portion of it, and Nero blamed the Christians. And so Tacitus writes about this event, and he says that Nero blamed the fire in Rome on Christians who followed a man named Crestus, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate. And this man, Crestus, the movement around him broke out both in Judea and in Rome. And so here we see two sources that say Jesus was real. So we're just going to set that one over to the side. Jesus is a real person. Now let's get to, okay, he's a real person. He existed, but is he God? That is the question we are tackling today. And for all of us in the room, whether we have said yes to Jesus or not, at one point in our lives, and I would argue in all point of our lives, we do not 100% fully understand who Jesus is. Can, can we all admit that, even the Christians in the room? We do not 100% fully understand who Jesus is. I think we'd all like to be like, the pastor knows everything about Jesus. I don't know everything about Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And if we're honest, this, this brings some beauty and some difficulty. The beautiful thing is we get to know God more each day. The difficult thing is I don't know everything about God. And I would like to know everything about God. Some of us are very intellectual thinkers, and we like to research a topic as much as possible. But there's a point when we run out of things that other people have written about God. And it's up to us to find out more. And yet, in, in this difficulty of not knowing everything about Jesus, literally billions of people on the earth have come to the conclusion that there is something special about Jesus. Billions of people currently living, and for the last 2,000 years, have come to the conclusion there's something different about this Jesus guy. He wasn't just a normal dude. And so what are the things that they believed in, that they thought about, that led them to this conclusion that Jesus is special? All people, every continent, except for maybe Antarctica, every continent, all people coming to a conclusion, something special about this guy. What was it? Well, the Christians, as we've kind of gotten to, believe that Jesus is God. And this started with the Jewish people people that were a part of Judaism. And they believed that there was a hero promised for them, that someone was going to come save their nation, save them as, as a people group, that God would send a hero to make all things right, to bring peace, or in their words, shalom, wholeness, completeness. And in the Bible, we have a man named Paul who wrote extensively about Jesus. And the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 9, verse 5, referring to Israel, he says, theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. If we take that verse and, and we pull it apart into the original Greek. That, that phrase, human ancestry, can also be translated according to the flesh. According to the flesh mean when it comes to the regards of being a human being. So this Jesus Christ, according to the flesh, was humanly the Messiah. He came from that lineage that was promised. But according to spiritual things, he was also God. So Paul makes the argument, Jesus Christ, fully man, fully God. But what led him to this conclusion? For some people, they look to the Old Testament, what we would refer to the Old Testament or what others would refer to as the Hebrew Scriptures. And in these Scriptures, there are prophecies, things pointing to the future, saying this is what God says, this is what his plan is. And there is a, a song written in the book of Psalms, chapter 2. And this is written over a thousand years before Jesus existed. 
or came to the earth. Psalm 2 says, Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So this this psalm that's read in a thousand years before Jesus says, hey, the the, the nations of the world are upset with this king, this, this king in Zion, which is another name for Jerusalem. They're, they're upset with the king in Jerusalem, and God laughs because he says, I set up that king. And the word for king there is anointed one, which in Hebrew is Messiah. That, that's where we get our word Messiah. And that's where they get these prophecies of there will be a special one an anointed one, a Messiah, and he will be the king over Jerusalem who will rule all the nations of the earth. And what does God say to this king? You are my son, today I become your father. And so from this passage, that's how they came up with this title, the son of God, that the Messiah, the promised hero, would be the son of God. So later on, when we see Jesus referred to as Son of God, understand that we're thinking Messiah in Psalm 2. So this psalm, written over a thousand years, is not the only thing that mentions there's someone coming. The prophet Isaiah, about 400 years after this psalm was written, so we're still 600 years away from Jesus, Isaiah writes, about this man referred to as the suffering servant. And he says in verse 4 of chapter 53, Surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace. What did we say peace was earlier? Shalom, wholeness, completeness. The punishment that brought us shalom was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, and each one of us has turned to his own way. And God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So Isaiah says that there would be someone who would suffer for our sins. For for the bad things that that humanity has done, there will be someone who comes and takes care of that. And, And for the Israelites of Isaiah's day, this would be a little weird because that's not how their sacrificial system works. You you can't say, I can't go to someone else and say, hey, can you die for my sin? I I don't want to die for my sin. Can you do it for me? No, in in the Israelite sacrificial system, an animal died. uh, Not philosophically. uh, In in a metaphorical way, your, your sins are transferred to that animal, and that animal dies for you to be made right with God. But God told them that, hey, this is only temporary, Because you keep on sinning. There needs to be a day when there is a heart change, when something changes inside of you. And there's going to be a greater ultimate sacrifice. And so Isaiah says there's going to be a dude. And this dude is going to have everything laid on him. And what are we told? Our sin on this man. 
His punishment brings us shalom. His wounds, the blood dripping from his side, brings us healing. And for the Israelite people, the Messiah, what do we read in Psalm 2? The anointed one who has the rod of iron, who rules over all the nations, that guy doesn't really sound like a suffering person. That doesn't sound like a loser. The suffering servant, no offense, sounds like a loser. He's the guy that lost. We considered him punished by God. So these prophecies point to someone coming, someone special, who would rule, who would save, who would heal, who would take our sin on himself. But what did Jesus say about himself? What are the things of Jesus' teaching that Jesus himself told people? In Mark chapter 2, verses 6 through 12, there's a story about Jesus teaching people in a house. And the house is so crowded that some friends want to bring their friend to Jesus to get healed. He's a paralytic. He can't walk. And so they carry him on a mat, and they go up on the roof of this house, and they perform vandalism as they rip off the top of this roof and lower their friend down into the middle and say, hey, Jesus, could you heal our friend? Sorry, we had to rip the roof off. We couldn't make it to you. (laughs) And and the story tells us that Jesus looks up at them, sees their faith. They, they, They believed in God so much that they believed ripping off a roof was worth the effort for their friend to meet Jesus and be healed. And so Jesus looks at their faith, and he turns to the man, and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And that's where we pick up in verse 6. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there, and they were thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So Jesus tells a man, your sins are forgiven, and the religious leaders have a big problem with that, because who's allowed to do that? Who can tell someone that their sins are taken care of? God and God alone. And so they say, excuse me, Jesus, that's blasphemy. That's a pretty big issue for us. And Jesus says, which is easier for me to tell him that, hey, your your sins are forgiven, or to say, man who's never walked in his life, get up, grab your mat, and leave. It's easier to just tell him your sins are forgiven because I don't have to prove that. He He can leave today and be like, you know what, Jesus said I'm good with God, and that really gives me peace. But if Jesus says, get up, take your mat, and walk, and it doesn't happen, I would argue that's a little bit harder to prove. So Jesus has kind of set them up a little bit, and he's like, so to prove that the Son of Man, his favorite title for himself, to prove that the Son of Man has the authority to back up everything that he says, hey man, get up, take your mat, and get out of here. And he gets up, takes his mat, and walks out. So if Jesus could do the thing that he argued was harder, is it possible that he might actually be able to back up the phrase that he can forgive sins? In John chapter 2, another story, Jesus is teaching, and and Jesus teaches a lot, and sometimes people ask follow-up questions. And so here in John 10, 24, it says, the Jews who are gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, the promised hero, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name, all of these miracles and signs and wonders, they testify about me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. 
I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Whenever Jesus refers to God, he refers to him as the Father. And here Jesus doesn't just say, I have the special relationship with God. He says, God and me, we're one. And again, just like at the earlier passage I read, all of the Jews say, hold up, blasphemy again. <laughs> Jesus, you got to stop saying these things. These aren't okay. But Jesus says, I told you plainly who I am, and the things that I do and the things that I say should explain to you that, yes, I am the Messiah, and I'm not the Messiah you're expecting because I and the Father are one. At Jesus' trial before the religious leaders, we find that in Matthew chapter 26. It, it, it's come to Jesus on trial, and, and once and for all, they're going to ask that question again. The high priest said to Jesus, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to you all, to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. So it, it's not just Jesus teaching in the streets. It's not just Jesus is with his, with his disciples on trial before all of the leaders of, of Judaism and the nation of Israel. Jesus declares, it is as you've said it is. I am the Messiah, and you will see me seated at the right hand of God Almighty. They tear their clothes because in their mind, if Jesus can't back it up that he's God, then he's just a normal dude. And this means he has said he and God are one, and this is blasphemy. In their eyes, he is worthy of death, and he will go on to die. So we have the prophecies. We have words that Jesus said about himself. And we have this, this, this event that we call the resurrection. And in Matthew 16, 21, Jesus explained to his disciples that this resurrection was coming. It says in Matthew 16, 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, that he must suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. So Jesus started calling the shots. Hey, I'm going to die. I'm going to be betrayed, handed over to these people. Another time that Jesus predicts his death, he also says, I'm going to be handed over to the Gentiles, to the Roman government, and I'm going to die by their hands, a.k.a. crucifixion. And then I'm going to rise from the dead three days later. Prophecy, Jesus' is teaching, Jesus' is words on the resurrection, and then what do we see happen in history after these things take place? Tradition tells us that 11 out of 12 of Jesus' disciples, his inner circle, if you will, they all went on to die martyrs' deaths. What does that mean? It means they died because they believed in Jesus, because they were telling other people about Jesus, and they refused to say otherwise. They, they refused to take it back. And be like, you know what? It didn't really happen. Changed my mind. I would rather live. They would rather die than say anything otherwise. And not just these inner circle disciples, but all throughout the last 2,000 years, especially in the Roman Empire, but it still happens today, people who follow Jesus unwilling to change their mind, even when threatened with death. Peter Kreeft, Dr. Peter Kreeft, a professor currently at Boston College in the King's College, has this quote. He says, Why did thousands suffer torture and death for this lie if they knew it was a lie? 
What force sent Christians to the lion's dens with hymns on their lips? What lie ever transformed the world like that? Thomas Aquinas, a theologian who lived in the 1200s, he was quoted as saying, if the incarnation did not really happen, then an even more unbelievable miracle happened. The conversion of the world by the biggest lie in history. And the moral transformation of lives into unselfishness, detachment from worldly pleasures, and radically new heights of holiness by a mere myth. And what about people today? Because I've met people who have said, I have heard God speak to me. I have heard him say to find Jesus Christ. I've opened this Bible and it's like it's alive and the words are jumping off the page and no other book does that for me. When I pray in the name of Jesus, things happen. Supernatural things. Didn't work when I tried any other name, but in the name of Jesus, things happen. We started this morning... Jesus asking the question, who do people say I am? He he then shifts after the disciples ask the question, and he focuses it back to the disciples. And I would also say back to us. Who do you say I am? I think Jesus still asks that today. What do you say about me? Who am I? Do you think Jesus is just a good teacher? A prophet sent from God? A wise man? Is he more than that to you? There's a very famous quote from C.S. Lewis, theologian and author of Chronicles of Narnia, is probably his most famous work. And a lot of people have heard this quote, but it's so good that we just got to keep repeating it. C.S. Lewis says, I'm trying to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people do often say about Jesus that I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of thing that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says that he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him. You can kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. Now, it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. There's a reason that he wrote that decades ago. People still bring it up. So what do you think about Jesus? All this stuff that we've talked about, does does any of that stir within you? what, What if this is real? What if this is true? What if we all set our life's compass to follow after Jesus? If everyone followed after Jesus, I do believe that this world would be a better place. As we talked about of of looking at 2,000 years of history and the changed lives, there are so many people that have gone from the worst people to people that you never thought possible. What, What if Jesus did that transformation for everyone on the planet? That there were no more addicts because we found something better than any drug could give. That there's no longer lonely people because we found our Heavenly Father. What would our world look like? I believe that we would change the world. So will you join me?
as I follow Jesus. The bottom line for us this morning is because of Jesus' own testimony about himself, Jesus is either God or a fraud. There is no middle ground. That, That is the choice that we are left. Is Jesus legitimately God or is he a fraud? Jesus demonstrated his deity through prophecy, through teaching, and the resurrection. I'll say that again. He said he demonstrated his deity through prophecy, through teaching, and through the resurrection. I always like to end my messages with a next step. What is my next step? Based on what I've heard today, what am I walking out of here with? What am I going to do with this information? Because we're all on a spectrum when it comes to knowing God. Some of us are further along than others, and therefore our steps are different. For some of us, it might be to say yes to Jesus. That You know what, these things that you've shared this morning, I think there might be something legitimate here. Your next step might be, I have more questions. And I need more answers before I can make that decision. Your next step might be, I've never thought about it this way. I believe in Jesus, but this has really given me clarity. And I want to go and tell other people just one thing that I took away from this message. What's one thing that grabbed me that I could share? I don't have to memorize Pastor Mark's sermon. I can just share one simple, easy thing that I remembered. Or maybe it's to just... Come and be a part of something. Come and be a part of this church. We have time after this service that we set aside just to mingle and have lunch together. And your next step could be something as simple as, hey, I'm going to hang out and have a meal with these people that seem just the nicest people I've ever met in my life. Or maybe just come back next week. Our next question is going to be, is the Bible reliable? Maybe you're like, man, that pastor read a lot out of the Bible about Jesus, and that's kind of convincing, but how do I know that this is true? Come back next week. We'll talk about it. Praise the Lord. All right, I'm going to invite Pastor Heather to come up, and she's going to pray over communion. She's going to explain what communion is, and I'd like to invite the worship team to come up as well, but join me in prayer. Jesus, I thank you, God, that you are God. Jesus, that the things that we have heard, the things that we have witnessed, the things that have been written down and told to us, at least to me, are pretty gosh darn convincing. Jesus, I thank you that you are moving and active and alive and doing stuff today. Would you continue to show up? Jesus, for anyone in this room that's on the fence about you, I pray that their questions are answered. I pray that they keep asking questions. I pray against the fear of asking a dumb question because that does not exist. Jesus, you are the one who put out the invitation. You said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And so, Jesus, we come to you today because sometimes we're tired of our questions and we need an answer. So, Jesus, would you show up today in a mighty way? It's in your name we pray. Amen.